What's up guys, Ben here and welcome to Motivation to Invest. William O'Neill is a legendary stock market broker with an estimated $100 million. He started his own stock brokerage firm in the 1960s and the Investor's Business Daily IBD newspaper in the 1980s before creating one of the most legendary stock investing books of all time, How to Make Money in Stocks, The Seven Step Can Slim System. This is an extensive book full of some golden gems about stock investing. However, many of its points are also very controversial as they are, as they are contradictory to value investing and Warren Buffett's buy and hold investing style. In the book, William O'Neill completed a study from the 1950s through to the year 2000, analyzing over 600 of the biggest winning companies in history. For example, a $1,000 investment into Microsoft on the day of its initial IPO in 1986 will be worth more than $1.6 million today. There's also Texas Instruments, which went from $25 to $250 in just a few years, and limited stores, which had 3,500% increase in just five years. O'Neill's style is that of an active investor and trader. He uses a lot of stock charts and technical analysis, in addition to fundamental business analysis, in order to analyze a stock and find great times to buy and great times to sell. So in this video, I'm gonna deep dive into his CanSlim system and see if it's right for you and your investments. So if you want to learn how to make money in stocks, then let's dive in. Right guys, so here we are in the CanSlim system. C stands for current quarterly earnings per share increases. So what you wanna be looking for is that there has been a major percentage increase in the quarterly earnings per share. For example, between say Q2 of 2020 and Q2 of 2019. Make sure it's the same quarters which you are comparing to take into account for the seasonal effects on business. Now, O'Neill suggests that you should be looking between 25% to 50% more increase in quarterly earnings per share. And the best stocks have earnings up 100% to 500% plus. Um, many super stocks also showed accelerated quarterly earnings growth. Example, you could have 15% um, earnings growth in a year and then 40 to 50% earnings growth in the following year. Now that is accelerated growth. So it's not just continually growing at 15%, which is still fantastic. It's actually accelerating. So that was one of the major traits of these super stocks, such as uh, Microsoft back in the late 90s. On to point two, A, which stands for annual earnings increases, and you should expect significant growth. So select stocks with 25% to 50% plus annual growth rates. So you're not just looking at the quarterly earnings, you're looking at the annual earnings also, which personally, I tend to look at over the quarterly earnings as a more of a long-term investor. But William O'Neill suggests looking at both. So he suggests using what's called an EPS rating, pairs the two most recent quarters earnings growth compared to the same quarters of one year prior. Then it also looks at the three year annual growth rate and gives you a single rating for the stock. So between, it's between one and 99, 99 is the best. So an EPS rating of 99 means that the company has outperformed 99% of all other companies both in terms of annual and quarterly earnings. Price to earnings ratio is not important. This is one of the most controversial parts that William Neal suggests in his um, book, that price to earnings ratio is important. So if you've read anything by Warren Buffett or Benjamin Graham, the guy who taught Warren Buffett, talks all about value investing or even Seth Klarman, you'll know that in value investing, price to earnings ratio is vital. You want to be looking at companies with a low price to earnings ratio to give yourself a margin of safety when investing. O'Neill says it's a load of rubbish. He says value investors are wrong in that sense. He says the primary consideration should be given to whether the rate of change of in earnings is substantially increasing or decreasing. So this earnings per share, he says that's a lot more important whether that's increasing or decreasing compared to the price to earnings ratio. 
So even if a company has a high price to earnings ratio, such as Microsoft, Home Depot, Cisco, during the late 90s, they were still fantastic companies to invest in. So in the words of William O'Neill, don't let the high PE stop you if all the other fundamentals are there for the business. Coming at point number three, new products, new management, and new highs. From O'Neill's study, he noticed that businesses which are introducing new products reach new stock market highs. For example, Microsoft was up 1,800% in just six years, between the years of 1993 and 1999, after introducing its new Windows software, which of course dominated the market. But it's not just tech companies and one-off companies such as Microsoft. Even you've got oil companies here, Houston Oil and Gas, with a major new oil field. Its stock went up 968% in just one year. And there's various other examples in this book. Um, I think it's very interesting to analyze this. But of course, being devil's advocate, you've got to ask the question, is the company's new product going to be successful? What's the likelihood of it going to be successful? What's the business's expertise in this new area? You've got to ask these questions because if the new product's not successful, it's hard to envision that the stock price will follow. Um, also look for new management. If they've had so-called caretaker management, which a lot of large companies have, which basically just looks after the company, but they don't do anything innovative and anything exciting, then new management, a new lease of life into the business, a new strategy can allow for a great increase in stock price. So that's point number three. So the new high paradox, we'll briefly discuss this. This is another contradictory factor which William O'Neill discusses, which is controversial compared to Warren Buffett's value investing style. So from O'Neill's study, what seems to be too high in price and risky to the majority usually goes higher, while what seems low and cheap usually goes lower. Stocks on the new high list tends to go higher and stocks on the new low list tends to go lower. Now, this is complete opposite of value investing, which is buy low, sell high. This O'Neill strategy is more buy high, sell higher. Um, one caveat to this, I'd say you need to use stock charts, technical analysis to support your potential buy. So don't take these words as literal, the stock price is high, it's going to go higher or the stock price is low, it's going to go higher. You've always got to do other analysis. Um, O'Neill, he prefers more technical analysis looking at the charts. Buffett prefers more fundamental analysis looking at the business. Um, both have their merits, but you've just got to know what strategy you're using. So you can say, has the stock entered a new high from a solid base, if you're looking at the charts, or from volatility? So this rule is buy high and wait for it to go higher doesn't work if the stock's been very volatile in the past because of course it could reach a new high and drop again. He's saying if it's formed from a solid base then there's potential for it to reach even higher um, figures. So it's just a very interesting concept to be aware of, keep an open mind with this style of investing. On to the next, number four, S is for supply and demand. That's the number of shares outstanding plus big volume demand. So is there a big or small supply of stock? So stocks with more stocks out, shares outstanding, shall I say, will be more volatile, thus the price will increase easier. For example, a stock with 5 million shares outstanding will be easier to budge than a company with 50 million shares outstanding. So it's just an interesting factor to look at. Of course, smaller companies, they increase in price faster, but they'll also decrease in price faster. So that's just something you need to be aware of. They're a lot more volatile. You can get faster gains, but you can also lose your capital faster. Um, he also likes to look for a low debt to equity ratio. I personally use the current ratio and I look for businesses with a current ratio greater than two. Look for management, which owns the stock. Um, they call this skin in the game. So you want to see that the management of the CEO's interests are aligned with the business. Because if they don't own the stock and they're running the business, what faith do they have in the business? It's crazy. So always check that the management or the CEO, 
the CFO, they have shares in the business because that really does help to align the interests of both the shareholders and the people who are actually running the business. On to number five, L in the cancelling system is for leader or laggard. Now this is actually complementary to Warren Buffett's style of investing. So he says buy the best two or three stocks in a group. The top two or three stocks can have, can have unbelievable growth while others in the pack may hardly move. So Buffett agrees, he looks for market leaders in of well-known strong brands. So of course, Buffett's investing in companies such as Coca-Cola, Wells Fargo, Walmart, ExxonMobil, Gillette. So he's obviously even Berkshire Hathaway is now a well-known brand. So these are the companies that Buffett likes, well-known strong brands, number one leaders in their industry. Apple is another great example. Um, O'Neill suggests using the IBD relative price strength index. So he says between 1 and 99, 99 means the stock outperformed 99% of all of the companies. He found from the study an average of 87 for super stocks between 1950s to the year 2000, just before their major run-ups. Now that's key there. What you want to be looking for is if you're investing into a great stock, you've recognized it a great stock, you want to be investing into it just before it does its major run-up. It might have already had a great price increase, but if you're going to invest a lot into it, you want to get it just before it hits that major, major high. So that's point number five. Point number six, I, is for institutional sponsorship. So O'Neill says follow the leaders. He suggests only buying stocks which have at least a few inst institutional sponsors with better than average performance records. So invest in stocks with an increasing total number of institutional owners in recent quarters. Now, this is slightly contradictory to Peter Lynch's suggestion, the great investor, which he suggests looking for stocks which don't have institutional owners and getting early before them and um, invest into them. Now, both methods are correct. I'd say if institutions are investing into these stocks, then you know it's a good stock generally because you know this institution has got a good record they've done the analysis and they're investing into the stock like google facebook a lot of those are owned by institutions they've done their groundwork they know it's a great stock and they're investing into it um, a risk of this is of course it might mean the stock price is valued very high because these institutions have put a lot of smart money in and this smart money can also if they spot an issue with the company they can sell a lot of their shares fast and get out before the average investor um, they say the smart money comes in first, the smart money sells first, and the smart money survives. So it's hard to compete with the large institutions in their own game. Um, and that's why Peter Lynch suggests looking for smaller companies, which they may be great companies, but institutions will just ignore because on paper they're too risky. And um, back in the sort of 1980s, 1990s, when Peter Lynch wrote his book, One Up on Wall Street, he suggested there was a saying on Wall Street called um, no one ever got fired for investing into IBM. Because IBM was just seen as this giant, respectable, trustworthy tech company which is always going to grow and achieve. And even if it got standard results, you wouldn't get fired as an investment broker for investing into a company such as IBM. Um, I could liken this company today to maybe somebody like Microsoft today or um, Google, Alphabet, like institutional investors are not going to get fired for investing into these companies. And finally, M. M stands for market direction and how to determine it. Now, this is the part of the system which is technical analysis. So he's looking at charts, he's looking at the data, he's looking at the trading volumes to see what direction is the market in. Are we in a bull market? Are we in a bear market? Um, so he wants to understand the stage of the market cycles. Um, another point that you should be aware of, a 33% 30 drop requires a 50% rise in your stock to break even. Now that's a mathematical fact. Um, I've done a video, um, I think on my Benjamin Graham video, where I analyzed this fact, and it is true. Um, it basically suggests using stop losses and selling fast, cutting your losses. So a big rule in trading um, O'Neill's got a very sort of trading style, even though he's, he calls himself more of a momentum investor. He uses a 7 to 8% trading rule. So if your stock drops below 7 or 8%, then he suggests that you sell out.
um, cut your losses, that's it. Whereas Warren Buffett, he would suggest, hold on, hold on. If you know the company is a good company, hold on and it will rise again. Um, like I say, like me personally, I think both strategies and styles have their merits in the in the situation. Just know what strategy you're using. Um, I personally use Buffett style for the majority of my investments in that if my stock drops 8 10%, I, I don't care. I'll, I'll let it drop because I'm a long-term investor. I'll hold on to it till it reaches higher highs. However, if I was investing into more of a risky speculative company um, and I was analyzing it in more detail and I was watching the stock charts, then potentially I'd use the 7 or 8% rule to cut my losses short. Um, definitely if I was trading, I'd use that rule. Um, so O'Neill also suggests buying stocks when they emerge from a consolidation period from a strong base. So when you're buying a stock, and about the higher highs, if the base isn't strong, if you look at a stock chart, he says, don't buy it. Wait for the base to be strong and then buy it. And there's various different formations, cup and handle formation. Um, I won't go into detail on trading technical analysis in this video, but maybe in the future, if that's something that you guys be interested in. Let's apply O'Neill's um, cancelling strategy to a popular stock, which is in my portfolio, Facebook, um, great stock. So the first two points, he talks about quarterly earnings increase and uh, annual earnings increase. So as you can see, looking at the Facebook's numbers here, earnings is another word for profit. So as you can see, the profit has been increasing annually, year on year, by a compounding annual growth rate of 36.9%. So this passes um, O'Neill's test for the first two points for the C and the A of the cancelling strategy. So it's got a 36.9% increase in profits and it has been compounding over time. There was obviously a couple of years, slight decrease here, um, year 2019, but then it's predicted to increase again. So that's something very interesting to look at. He also looks at this should be backed by revenue growth as a support. So revenue at Facebook is also growing at a nice steady 41.5% compounding growth rate, which is fantastic. So yeah, that's the first two points of the cancelling strategy. Point number three of the cancelling strategy, new products, new management, new highs. Facebook's not got new management and I don't wish them to have new management. Mark Zuckerberg is an incredible CEO and he's got skin in the game. He founded the company, he's got shares in the business. So he ticks all the boxes from that um, side of the an analysis. New products, what's Facebook looking at? Is it just a social media platform? Well, they're also, they've done a lot of acquisitions. So they invested into WhatsApp, they invested into Instagram. So they, they own a lot of um, other businesses in the social media networking space. So if I look at the, so they're obviously the, they're the market leader in the social networking space. They own WhatsApp, which is number three, Facebook Messenger, Instagram. They also own an advertising business which runs ads on places such as TikTok, which is a sort of new, innovative social media platform popular with very young people. Um, new products, they're constantly innovating. So Facebook's recently rolled out shops, which turns business profiles into shore, uh, storefronts. This has been great during the pandemic when things have been closed. A lot of businesses, um, this can help a lot of businesses transition online and sell different products. They also plan to introduce a payment system to help with payments being taken directly through Facebook and money transfers being available. So Facebook's very innovative in that sense. It's introducing new products and now would be a great time to invest. I, I personally think so. Um, it's going for a few news problems at the moment with companies pulling back ad spending to me that will cause the stock price to drop and could be a great time to get in there um i've done so myself but yeah it's, it's got new products so it passes the um n part of the cancelling strategy another new product which they're looking at this is more speculative but facebook's looking at a lot of augmented reality virtual reality so this just shows a cartoon of mark zuckerberg as he toured um, hurricane struck Puerto Rico in virtual reality. So basically what Mark Zuckerberg envisages is um, 
people will be wearing virtual reality, augmented reality glasses, and they'll be walking around um, the streets in different countries with a virtual avatar um, and be able to interact with other avatars in 3D space. Now, sounds a bit like science fiction, but it's a new sort of innovative product which is working. And if you look at Facebook's mission statement, it's just to connect the world. So with the addition of augmented reality and virtual reality, it's another way for Facebook to connect the world. So I just think that's a very interesting play um, to look at. Amazon, another great company which ticks these boxes, that are constantly innovating, they've got new products, new services. So that definitely ticks the boxes of um, the first three parts of the canceling strategy. Next part, supply and demand. So number of shares outstanding plus big volume demand. Um, details of this here, I can't really analyze this fully at the moment. You've got the shares outstanding here. Average volume, 26 million. So if I did some technical analysis on the business, you'd see, does it have high demand in terms of the shares and the volume? But I won't go into that in this video. Leader or laggard, already discussed this. Facebook is a market leader. It's virtually got a monopoly on social media and on um, social networking. So having a monopoly on social networking, of course, it's number one leader, um, Facebook. It also owns number three, and it also owns Instagram here, which is extremely popular and expanding. So Facebook's definitely up there. It's definitely a market leader. So that passes that point number five of uh, canceling strategy. Institutional sponsorship, of course, Facebook own, is owned by many, many institutions. Let's see if I can get the institutions up here. Major shareholders. So Vanguard Group, Fidelity Management and Research Company, BlackRock, State Street Global Advisors, Capital Research. So these are the big institutional investors who own shares in Facebook. So it passes that part of the test. What else have we got? Market direction. So yeah, this is to do with buy points in terms of, is it the right time to buy? Are we entering a bull market, a bear market? Um, that's technical analysis, not specific to the, the stock necessarily. Um, but yeah, from the little example I've done there, Facebook passes the canceling strategy, um, apart from the technical parts, which I've not analyzed, but generally from a fundamentals point of view, Facebook passes that strategy. So it's an interesting strategy to look at. Um, I'll go over a couple more points in the book, um, how to make money on stocks. Just a couple of the mistakes that he says that normal investors make, um, and just see if that's of interest to you. So if I go down, classic mistakes. Um, a lot of these are contradictions to my investing style and the um, consensus investing style and Warren Buffett's investing style. So first one, don't select second rate stocks because of dividends or low price to earnings. So as stated earlier, O'Neill firmly believes that earnings per share growth is the most important factor you can be looking at when investing into a stock. And better performing companies tend not to issue dividends. Instead, they reinvest their capital into research and development. Um, I agree with that point um, with regards to dividends. And I think as if you if you know in your heart, I'm investing into a company because it's a dividend stock and I want this income, then that's fine. But don't necessarily think it's a great company because it's serving a dividend. To me, the dividend is a cherry on top, but not the full cake. Um, the great Benjamin Graham, value investor, he loved dividends, but to me, it's more of an old school um, style of investing. He wrote his book, Intelligent Investor, back in 1949, and dividends were, every stock had to be paying a dividend, every good stock or investors just wouldn't stick around. These days, investors stick around on many stocks which don't pay a dividend. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about dividends, um, as long as you know that other fundamentals of the stock are still there. P ratio is low because the company's path record is inferior. So that's a quote by O'Neill. Personally, that's one I'm, I sort of don't agree with. I say yes, in the majority of cases, the price to earnings ratio will be low because its earnings are suspected to decrease. And that's why 
and there's not much of a good sentiment on the stock. So I, I agree with that part of it, of it. However, there are specific circumstances um, and that's what being a contrarian investor, investor is about where you can spot a company with a low price to earnings ratio because of bad sentiment. Um, a quick example of this I'll give you is during the 2020 market crash, oil industry, real bad sentiment, oil prices were going negative, low PE ratio on some fantastic companies such as Shell, BP, Chevron. Um, I invested into them, um, made a 70, 60, 70, 80% profit on my investment within just three weeks. Um, they had low PE ratios um, because of obviously the earnings had been hit, but the sentiment was a lot worse than the earnings, um, than the earnings catastrophe, shall I say. Um, so that's just something to look at. There's many nuances to become a really successful stock market investor. Um, and you've just got to be aware and keep an open mind. Um, I think never just be, I'm solid, like this is my way of thinking, I won't take any other input. Um, and that's why I found it fascinating to read this book because the the various ways he talks about the different, like the different points he makes are very contradictory to classic styles I've learned previously, such as Buffett or Seth Klarman or Bill Ackman. Um, so yeah, let's go over a few, a couple, couple more of these points. Have a when to sell strategy. So completely different to Buffett. Buffett is buy and hold. Don't worry when to sell. O'Neill, no. He said have a have a when to sell strategy. So the key to winning big in the stock market is not to be right all the time, but to lose the least amount possible when you're wrong. So his style is to take your losses quickly and your profits slowly. So he uses the 8% rule to cut his losses and he uses around say 20% rule to take his profits. Um, don't fall for the price paid biases. So he says, just cause you paid a certain price for a company and it drops, don't expect it to rise again. It doesn't have to. Um, so obviously he uses charts, technical analysis to buy stocks that are going into new ground and price. Look at stocks objectively. I completely agree with that. You should always look at your stocks objectively don't get too emotionally attached to a stock um like i see a lot of youtubers and people around who've got t-shirts which say tesla on and they love tesla and they think it's a great company and i think it's a great company also and i've got shares in tesla but i'm not a, i don't follow it as a religion um like once tesla does something wrong or slips up the same as any other company bang i'll be there and i'll and i'll be either watching the price dip and buying more or I'll be selling off if it gets to a stage and I think, right, it's run as much as it can run. There's a bit too much over exuberance in the market. So look at stocks objectively. More on when to sell. A few quotes here. He says, sell when it's on the way up, not the top. Bulls make money. Bears make money. Pigs get slaughtered. So he says, don't be a greedy pig. If you see a stock and you think it's, it's run very very high um then sell some like my, my personal favorite style of this i'm not as strict on it as o'neill he takes 20 percent profit and cuts eight percent losses i'm more of a long-term investor in general however a couple of the stocks which i invested in um tesla is one of them boohoo is another stock fast fashion stock in the uk i invested into them 100 percent return within just four weeks um i doubled my money up and I could hold on longer. It's gone up to 150% now, Tesla. I could have held on longer and made even more money. Instead, I sold, I didn't sell my full holding, but I sold half my holding, took the profit, and then that investment in Tesla is now zero risk because I've already made my money back from my initial investment. Yeah, I could have held it longer and made an extra 50%, but now I've got zero risk in that investment and it's very volatile stock. So I'm happy with that style and it worked for me. Um, so a couple of points on O'Neill style. He says, don't sell for 25% or 30% gains. If the, if the, if the company investing is a market leader with institutional support still. So if the institutions are still back in the company and it's a market leader, then he says, you don't have to take your 25% profit, but if it's not take your 25% profit, cut your, cut your 8% losses. So it's an interesting style. Sell based upon unusual market action. So he looks at technicals, price, volume, 
and that's when he sells. So he looks for the points where the stock is sort of peaking. Um, he says, many stocks peak when earnings are up 100% and analysts are projecting further growth. Um, most of the analysts are wrong. So the many big institutional investors are smart when he gets out fast. It's something you've got to be aware of. But yeah, recognize when the stock market is topping and adverse volume or weak market action. So yeah, that's just some of the technical analysis. I'm not getting into that in this video, but. The canceling system seems to have many advantages over classic investing styles. And it's clear that to be a successful investor, there are a lot of nuances you need to be aware of. I plan to take some of the points of the canceling system and merge it with my current investing style. Generally, my style is that of a contrarian value investor, similar to Warren Buffett, in which I like to spot overlooked opportunities in exceptional businesses, purchasing shares at great prices when there is bad industry sentiment. This could be bad news, media attention, or even just a stock market crash. The Canslim system can reinforce finding these exceptional businesses by further analyzing its quarterly and annual earnings, looking at management, ownership, etc. I believe the key to successful stock market investing is to have a strategy, and more importantly, is to know which strategy you're using. For example, if you wish to invest into certain stocks using Warren Buffett's value investing style, know that that's the strategy you're using. For example, I've invested into these companies, they are buy and hold for the long term, doesn't matter if the stock market goes up or down, this is what I'm doing with these stocks. But then if you wish to try a more momentum style of investing or can slim um, strategy, try that with some different stocks and see how that fares you and see how well you do. But don't subconsciously blend the two. You can consciously pick the best elements of each one like I've done and try and use them in certain situations, but don't subconsciously blend the two. It could be very, very dangerous. So what are your thoughts on the Canslim strategy and this style of momentum investing? Let me know in the comments below and I'll join in the discussion. Now, I always get a lot of comments below asking Ben, which platform did you use to analyze the stocks in your videos? So I actually used in this video, I used Stockopedia. This is one of my favorite platforms for analyzing stocks. Due to their stock rank, it gives you a clean, simple way of checking the numbers on a great business before investing into it. If you'd like to check it out and see if it's a right fit for you, then I have some great news for you. So I've actually been given an exclusive 25% off discount link just for the viewers of Motivation to Invest. That's you guys. So I'll leave that in the link below. Check it out, go onto the website, see what you think, see if it's right for you. And then if you want to, you can purchase a subscription if it's right for you and if it helps you with your investing. In addition, if you enjoyed this video, go ahead, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. And if you'd like more stock market investing tips and exclusive stock picks, which I personally have invested into, then you should definitely subscribe to this channel. And with that being said, I will see you guys on the next video. Invest safe.